We're having a Christmas party. And you're invited. On the menu? Foods that celebrate the holiday traditions of my very special guests. We'll reconnect with their roots and mine. From the vibrant vineyards in Friuli, Italy. To the bustling markets of Chennai, India. The lively streets of Harlem. And back to my table in New York. It just doesn't get any better. Join me for a Christmas feast that celebrates the foods and traditions that reflect the cultural diversity of this country. I put together a table as diverse as America is, and the common denominator was food. And you know what? It worked great. It's a Christmas you will remember when Lydia celebrates America and we come home for the holidays. It was 1958 when I arrived in America and had my first Christmas in New York. The skyscrapers and bridges fascinated my brother and me. I remember visiting Rockefeller Center at Christmas time and seeing the bright twinkling lights of the tree and the windows on Fifth Avenue. I was just 12 years old. We settled into a small apartment in Astoria where I spent many happy holidays. It's more than 50 years later and today, my mother and I are preparing Christmas dinner for six close friends all from different cultures from around the world. Together, we will create a new Christmas celebration, one that embraces our past as well as our lives in America today. Voila. Joining me for this special celebration are actor Christopher Walken and his wife, Georgianne. Believe it or not, Chris was one of my first childhood friends when I came to America. We have something called Coquito which is a rum drink, which is really, really delicious. Actress Rita Moreno. She arrived in New York from Puerto Rico with her mother at the age of five. Rita is one of the few performers who's won all four major American entertainment awards. Mama, Senor Carlo Ponte. Oh. Conductor Carlo Ponte Jr. is the founder of the Los Angeles Virtuosi Orchestra son of Italian actress Sofia Loren and film producer Carlo Ponti Sr., he's been in the spotlight since birth. I'm excited about this sort of international American Christmas we're about to sit down to. It is. Journalist Anne Curry, born in Guam, was raised in America and Japan. Her father American, her mother Japanese. Oh, the mutada, I had it the first. Marcus Samuelson is a television personality and chef. Born in Ethiopia, he spent most of his childhood with his adoptive family in Sweden. I can always tell South Indian cooking from North Indian cooking. Because in South and Indian model and actress Padma Lakshmi. Padma is the host of Bravo's Top Chef. Born in India, she came to America when she was four. I love the I wanted to invite some friends over whose ancestry really means a lot to them and I know that it is part of who they are and why they are who they are. The menu for the evening celebrates their varied traditions. That's an acorn squash. Acorn squash. Starting with appetizers, we have marinated winter squash. Pizzette, inspired by Carlo's mother, Sofia Loren. And my version of Swedish meatballs one of Marcus's childhood favorites. Okay, I want your comments on my, on the, yeah. on, on my meatballs, yeah. okay? <laughs> As we ate, Chris and I reminisced about when both my mother and I worked with him in his father's bakery. The mother and the father, very, very nice people. Wait a minute, you're old friends? We're friends from way back. Way, way back. Way yeah. back. <laughs> on my the weekends. My had a bakery in, in, in the holidays Where? in Astoria. Yeah. Did you work at the bakery? I did. You worked I, when I was 14, and we went to, he, we worked together. He was doing his practices, his acting, but on weekends, we worked 
to I make a little pocket money. Sure, not bad. Sure. I, I delivered the cakes. Yeah, all the, <laughs> not all the time they got delivered. Sometimes they 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 flipped on short no, short stuff. Lydia's talking about a time I had six wedding cakes in the, in the <laughs> car and I jammed the brakes on. The whole thing came in the front seat. <laughs> oh, oh my! His father wasn't happy. Yeah. When he came back. Oh, <laughs> The holidays are a great time of the year to think and talk about who we really are and where we come from, our roots, our culture. And I think that the holidays bring all that together. Happy it's holidays. Such a great, great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having, having us. you here. All these talents of different kind of roots come together. Uh, it's such a pleasure having you all, and uh, I uh, enjoyed you all these years and loved you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we cooked together. My pleasure. It's a pleasure being had by you. <laughs> I have always believed that in order to celebrate the present and future, you must remember the past. That's why this summer, I decided to visit my homeland, Italy. I return every year to my vineyards in Friuli, which connect me to my grandma, Rosa. Rosa produced her own wine, and inspired by her passion, I now do the same. It keeps me grounded in a family tradition. You have a little bit of oak treatment, but you also get a lot of fresh. So you get the body, but a lot of fresh. It's exactly. very fresh in the nose. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Still a little tight because it's uh, young wine. It's, it's yeah, very, so very it's gonna need. Uh... But today I'm headed to the place where I was born and raised, Pula, formerly in Italy, now a city in Croatia. All of my early food memories stem from here. For me, coming back to Pula. Uh, I, I need it. I need it for my soul. I need it to be who I am. Uh, I need to be in touch with my roots periodically. This is the market where my grandmother and I shopped, bartered, and sold vegetables from her garden. I was always at her side and loved every moment of it. I feel very much part of America. Most of my life I did spend in America. And yet those 12 years that I spent in Italy and Istria never left me. This summer, I returned to my grandmother's house in the nearby village of Boussolaire, along with some of my grandchildren. There, we met up with my cousin Renato. You gotta go back to the source to understand who you really are, what your roots are. And uh, these are the beginning of your roots. All of them. I would visit this place as often as I could when I was young. It was full of life. And it was here, mostly through cooking with my grandmother, that I found my passion for food. The pigs, the rabbits, chickens and goats, and the vegetables and herbs growing here. Right here in this area, we had the goats and we used to milk them every morning and that's what we ate for breakfast, you know, ah, was great. polenta and goat milk. We made the ricotta from it we and so uh, it's delicious. This courtyard holds so many memories for me. Many of my relatives lived in the small houses surrounding it. For our extended family, this was the center of our lives. We sat down to enjoy the traditional flavors of the region and to reminisce about the Christmases of our past. Oh, eccola. Adesso se può questa corte era sempre così viva. Siamo i saluti. Saluti everybody and and uh, you know, these are where where your roots are. Salute. <laughs> For Christmas, Grandpa would get a juniper berry bush, and you know we didn't have all of the 
piglings and, right. and shining balls and this. Everything we hung was organic and natural. Oranges, orange season, Christmas, a little tangerines, a little toroni, uh, candies, and cookies that we baked. And you know, there was no presents under the Christmas tree. We were allowed to eat the tree. That was our present. As the group of us shared our memories of this wonderful place, Renato asked me how much my grandchildren knew of my history and the story of why I left my home in Pula. I know I shared with you the trip of our family when I was a little girl from here. We went back to Italy and then we, in, in the camp at San Saba. My family's journey began in 1956. It was a time when Pula was under Yugoslavian Marshal Tito's communist rule. We were Catholic and Italian, and after World War II, we were caught behind the Iron Curtain. It was very painful being thrown out of your land, if you will. If you had no intentions of being Yugoslavian, believing in the communist manifesto and so on, you had to leave. My story is like so many other immigrants who left their homelands in search of a better life. My family had a secret plan to leave Yugoslavia. My mother, brother, and I were granted visas to visit my aunt in Italy. My father would have to stay behind. We crossed the border to Trieste and eventually landed at the Riseria di San Saba, a refugee camp and former Nazi concentration camp. Today, it is a museum. This brings back an awful lot of memories, emotions, uh, just a lot of pictures, happenings flow through my eyes looking at this. Spent two years uh, from year 10 to year 12 in this camp here, and it's a political refugee camp. Walking around here now, I could remember how terrified I was as a child. They completely uh, undressed us, uh, disinfected us. Whatever they did to us, I know it was really frightening. And then we were put in this cell, very dark room with bunk beds, and this, this kind of window, it looked like a prison. My mother was crying. We were asking for my father, I recall continuously, and uh, you know, we're looking out of the window, maybe we would see him. We were afraid that we would lose him. All of those things to a child of 10 was traumatic. And I remember all the other people, all the, the hard lives and the laments of the other people kind of really taught me a lot about humanity. Just a few weeks after we left our home, my father escaped in the middle of the night and traveled for several days to meet up with us. I remember it was one o'clock at night or something, the middle of the night, and this knock on the door and my mother jumping out of the bed and crying, my aunt getting up. We kids didn't know what was going on. And my father came, you know, he was kind of ripped and he was unshaven because I guess it took him two, three days to cross the border. And, uh, you know, all of that emotion, we spent two years in the camp, hoping to one day be able to get to America. In 1958, we finally got that chance. We were sponsored by the Catholic Charities, and we were able to move first to New Jersey, then to Queens, New York. There's a knot that comes into my throat when I think of uh, my mother's and father's decision, just what they decided to do for us. And coming to America, I think that, you know, my drive, my desire was to show them that their decision was right. We settled in Astoria, and it was here that I met Christopher Walken. His family's bakery was right across the street. And your tomatoes are starting? Yeah, they're starting. You can put all your collection in here. We'll collect Christopher them. still visits my home on occasion. There you go. Take another I didn't know that they grow. We so love spending time thinking about the old days, 
and also getting inspiration about what to cook for my garden. <laughs> Very nice. Every week something different. Today I'm having Christopher back to my house for Christmas. And my mother, who is 94 years old, is helping prepare the dinner. This is, should we make it a little thinner? Sure. And okay. you can you can put with the different things on top. Okay. Now, I don't want you to waste too much. You remember you told me always to be very frugal, not to waste food. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. I listened once, <laughs> not always. Well, I've been listening to you a long time. I still listen to you. On this special day, Christopher Walken is the first to arrive. So, so, uh, Chris's mother was Scottish, his father German. He studied acting and dance as a child and has appeared in close to 100 films. The best dish is just that, what is it? Like me, he holds onto the traditions and work ethic of his immigrant ancestors. I had my first job with his parents in their pastry shop, Walken's Bakery. All those really German great cookies and cakes and you know, him and his two brothers, there were three brothers, were there working with me on weekends. So the commitment and his respect for, I guess, the hard work of his parents uh, ultimately, you know, really earned him this kind of resilience, if you will, uh, in, in the business and became a big success. We're cooking. We're cooking with gas here. Uh, uh. The first dish on our menu today is scallops. Scallops a la walk-in. The secret sauce? oranges and garlic. Now you have these oranges. Just throw a little in there, get some flavor, and maybe some garlic. So you see, when the garlic is just like this fresh, you don't get the cloves that you usually yeah. get. And I'm gonna kind of cut it in slices. Is that sure. just like that? It's very young. Oh yes, delicious. I put it in salads. It almost, it's, it behaves like an onion, but it's a garlic. A little chopped parsley here. Oh, I think that'll be good. And I'm going to put a little bit of this pepper flakes in here. A pepperoncino, I love that. You yeah, like your spicy too, food? It, yeah. It's good for you, too, no? Just put that. Yeah, you see, like this hot, and, and, and if you separate them so they have their own space, sure. then they'll get the color. That's it. Did you ever consider cooking as a profession? Well, you know, I think that it would probably be you know, actors, they play golf, they paint, they skydive, they do these things. But I think that to have a restaurant might be very, uh, a lot of fun. You see, they're forming now that, that caramelization that, you, that everybody likes, you know? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that looks good. Wow, Lydia, this is... <laughs> Love having you in my kitchen, like old times. Each dish that I made is a tribute to each of you. And this is Chris's dish. And you taught me how, and I figured that I oh. share with a friend. Is that a good? You. you taught her? But yours looks better. <laughs> you, you did a great job. You taught me no, it's well. Very tasty. Uh -huh. yeah. A little steam and a little frying. Frying a little, little steaming. Orange peels in there. Wow. You know, with some some garlic. It's just I a didn't squeeze get of the lemon. Brown. Huh? Mm. I didn't this get year. That nice yeah, yeah. But Chris, so, Chris, so what? What are you? He's a cook. He's, he's, he's a cook. he's a great cook. These are amazing. You know, to get um, scallops this way, getting the butter and just searing them one side. They are so delicious. Mm. It's so sweet. So delicious. A sign of a good cook is when they can cook with just a handful of ingredients. You know, you don't... During the conversation, I find that all my guests have different stories about their native homelands and coming to America. Padma Lakshmi is a food lover and an international superstar. She has lived all over the world, but she was born in India. She was kind enough to invite me to her birthplace in Chennai. Better the orange or the green? The green. Yeah. These are just smaller. It's a different. Wow. Good. 
Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> flowers are an important part of Indian culture. All these jasmine flowers have been done today. Today? Yeah, because it only lasts 24 hours. Otherwise, yeah. it will get brown. It will oxidize. My, the flower cover, madam. Padma is a unique individual, a beautiful woman, but it wasn't easy for her. I was uh, really surprised to see how rooted Padma is in her ancestry in that little neighborhood in Chennai. These garlands will be either used, you know, uh, to as an offering to Ganesh when the uh -huh. puja or ceremony is being done, or in a wedding also, you, you see the wedding garlands. Uh -huh. The wedding garlands are usually made with tuberose. Uh -huh. So for me, every time I smell tuberose, it makes me think of India. Moving between two cultures when I was a child was a bit difficult. You do always feel like a bit of an outsider, whether you're here in India or there in America. Now, as a grown-up, I think it's really um, been nothing but a positive influence on my life. Because not only did I get to really know two cultures instead of one, I had to assimilate into those cultures. And I also saw other cultures along the way. To escape the busy streets, Padma took me to one of her favorite places, the gardens and cafe at Amethyst, an oasis in the middle of Chennai. Padma, this is beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, I yeah. know. There's a madhouse out there of, of uh, little tutus, <laughs> tuk-tus, and motorcycles. Of auto rickshaws, yeah. motorcycles, and scooters, here is, goats. And here is like paradise. Yeah. It's so wonderful. Look it's at very these orchids. Serene. Are these orchids or what are they? They're not orchids. They're a different kind of tropical flower. They're, They're like Indian beautiful. petunias, They're I guess. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. As we sat down for tea, right. Padma told me she sees herself as both Indian and American. I feel very American and very Indian at the same time. And I don't think I could have necessarily had that experience in any other culture but America. I think because it's a culture of immigrants, you know, it is accepting and uh, it adapts and folds into its own culture, many aspects of other cultures. And I think that's what makes it really great and interesting. Because if you think about it geographically, But, but this is what America is all about. That's why America is so great. Because we all come from different roots, whether you're born here or your parents or you were born. And I think the understanding that you're talking about, we all have that openness. And we understand that we were accepted. And so we are very accepting of others. You talked earlier about Mr. Walken, Chris's father, same thing. He accepted you, liked you, but he was open to you. Yes. He was open to yeah. your family yeah. because of his own experience. Because I, he was an I immigrant ten, 10 years what before, like? yeah. 10 yeah. or 15 years before. But also, yeah. those neighborhoods, uh, you know, everybody was kind of struggling. Yeah. And people just, you know, people helped each other, I think, you know, yeah. extra. There's a possibility of openness here. Yeah. That, you know, it doesn't come all the time and it doesn't come every place you are. But boy, that possibility is rich, and it's, it, there's a long history of openness. And it's open this country, it's on to all of us. Anne Curry is a journalist. She worked for NBC News for 25 years before starting her own media company. Her parents came from two very different worlds. Her mother was Japanese. Her father was an American soldier. So uh, she is American uh, by, by her father, but she reverts a lot to her Japanese culture and customs. And, and I know that the, her holidays, and she cooks her mother's food a lot. And she teaches her children also, carries on. And I think that's very important. Anne's father wanted to marry, but in post-World War II Japan, his commanding officer wouldn't allow it. Bob Curry waited two years, then came back to Japan and married his Japanese sweetheart. Growing up, Anne told me, she identified as an American, though her father would never let her forget her Japanese roots. 
He used to always say to me, Anne, you're the best of both worlds. Don't let anyone tell you, you know, that you should feel bad about being uh, half Asian and half Caucasian. Be proud of both, never choose. Because if you ever choose, that means you're denying a part of yourself. Do you come with your family here sometimes? Well, I come here at least once a year, often more. But Since I wanted to include a dish for Anne at our Christmas table, I found my inspiration on a trip to the Sunrise Mart in Manhattan this past summer. So, have you ever been to this market before? No, I have never been to this market, and I'm really looking forward to I'm it. I'm excited. Yeah. The Sunrise Market is my favorite, one of my favorite spots in New York City, and you can find all kinds of vegetables you'd never find anywhere. They use a lot of radishes and uh, um, some like mushrooms. Food. Does this bring you home? Does this bring you to your mom, the smells, the looks of everything? Well, for me, it's, uh, you know, I've missed, I've lost it. So when I come in here, I feel her because, you know, food is a language. It helps us connect. It's like an invisible thread to our ancestors, to me. And so when I come in here, I feel my mother. I feel, so, oh, she, her excitement. Oh, so, I have so this I rice. Wanna, I want to travel with you. Okay. Your mother's All right. Home. Well, my mother, first okay. thing she would do is tell me about what the rice. The and she would buy one of these massive bags of rice. She would want a very short grain rice. A short she, grain. My mother's family were rice farmers for more than 400 years. Wow. In Yamagata, which is the place where I'm told the premier rice comes from. My mother was one of those people you see in the prints with the thatched, uh, you know, kind yes, of hat, yes. hats like this. Yes. And with her knee up she her knees in the water. water. She that the water. was my mom. That's, that's hard. I know. And her father. I know it's hard, but rice was it. It that was all was about. So we have an Italian break. rice and the Japanese rice. Okay. We've come together. All right. right. Deal. Okay. <laughs> it's a deal. Okay. All right. So, so what is your favorite food? Like, let's say, when you kind of now your, your mother is gone and you get kind of that that uh, uh, feeling inside that emptiness, what do you go to? Okay, you asked for it. We're going this way. Okay. <laughs> The food is called natto, N-A-T-T-O. And natto. this is the food that my mother loved. It comes in these little containers, N-A-T-T-O, you can see there. And what it's is it? Fermented soybeans. Fermented, fermented so, yeah. gooey and yes. It takes a while to get used to, but I grew up on it. And they and make you love it, it. Oh, so much. It's made with um, soy sauce, green onions, and a little bit of this mustard seasoning. And you, it, you, you let it sit together, and then you put it over rice. And it's really good for you, actually. But it's just, it just makes me think of my mother. My mother loved it. It's kind of food of the mountain people. Yeah. It's, um, it's not sushi, but it's the food of my, mother, my but, mother's but, but it is. It, it talks to you. It talks Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. And it's delicious. If there's anything I make on New Year's Day, which is when we celebrate um, a ho the holiday that reminds me of my mother, it's Thanksgiving, I make the Thanksgiving turkey. The Christmas, I make my husband's culture, the you know Yorkshire pudding and the you know beef. Uh, the huge standing rib roast. But on New Year's Day, that's when we celebrate my mother's culture. So I make this for my children. I want them to feel her as I feel her. For Anne's mother, being here in America was often a struggle. There's a word that my mother used when things were tough. She would say, Anna, gombaru. Say, what does that mean? And she'd say, Kombaru, be strong. And I looked it up, and it means actually to never, ever, 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 ever give up, even and especially if there's no chance of winning. Gombaru. And I think that this is the story of America. This is a nation of resilient people. Paying tribute to Anne and her mother, I created a very special rice dish, risotto with mushrooms. In your honor, oh in your goodness. culture, uh, rice is such an important part of your growing up and family. So I thought I, I'd do it my way. This is arborio rice. You showed me the short grain yeah. rice, but it's the Italian way. Some risotto, is that okay? Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, you take care of that yes, side, I'll take care of this Absolutely. side. we got it. Okay. I want to say that this is one of the most wonderful experiences I've had in years. Thanks to you, Livia. I mean, this is amazing. Look at us. We are the world. 
Like Anne, Rita Moreno's mother also fought hard for a better life here in the United States. They moved to the Bronx, and at first, Rita hated it. She told me her story as we sat and talked in a Cuban restaurant. I feel pretty. Oh, oh, are we on camera? I had a really tough time as a child in New York City. It was not a friendly place. It was, if anything, very hostile. And um, of course, I never told my mother about the terrible names, but pe people called me people, kids. I learned so early in life that I had very little value because of who I was, that I spent a good part of my life not liking who I was and wanting desperately not to be Hispanic. For Rita, Hollywood was especially difficult. I think that being Puerto Rican at that time in my life, with respect to my career in films, or what I call Hollywood, was really tainted by an image that producers and directors and writers had in their mind of what a young Hispanic woman would be, and it was very, very limited. These young women usually were uneducated, they barely spoke English, and were not very smart, but God knows they were very, very sexual. Tiny, tiny notions of what a young Hispanic or black woman was about. And we were really stuck in that box. Lots of new housing with more space. Lots of doors slamming in our face. Her big break finally came with her now legendary performance as Anita in the movie West Side Story. Life can be bright in America. If you can fight in America. Life is all right in America. If you're all white in America. It took until West Side Story, where I was playing for the very first time a non-cliched Hispanic. The first time I was uh, in my late 20s playing a teenager. <laughs> Movies. Um, and I found my role model, and it was Anita. She was in West Side Story when I was that young immigrant and came to America. And I would look at that, that movie over and over, and I imagined myself, I'm like her. I'm an immigrant. Uh, you know, I want to be an American just, just like her. So this is my kind of fragrance. These are your flavors, this huh? Is my, this is my perfume. All right. Uh, let me get Hola, into it. El chef. We decided to cook up one of Rita's favorite childhood dishes from Puerto Rico. The restaurant calls it Picadillo Cua Cua. <laughs> so Rita, you make this at home sometimes? I make it for company. I, I make huge batches of this. And uh, you know, it has other great stuff in it, like raisins, olives, papers. Tomato, tomato sauce, okay. But this freezes so fabulously. Yeah? Ah. And, and then you just pull it out when your guests come. Pull it out, pull it so out. So you do a lot of entertaining. Now, you, your party, you must give a great party. I, I do give great parties, as a matter of fact. But you know what I love? I love to feed people. Don't you? I do. Well, that's what I do. But, but you feed them. I feed them with food. You feed them with soul, with music, oh. with everything else. I don't know how to do that, though. In Sicily, we use a lot of the raisins with fish, with meat. So yeah. it's not so far. You no, know? no, it's not. You'd be surprised how the cultures, you know, the base. Meat. 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 Isn't that interesting? Absolutely. Right. Okay. I'm going to take a little bit of raisin because that's what I love. Vamos comer de aquí, no probar. Did you get a raisin? I did. These huh? are. Platanos maduros, meaning sweet plantains, ripe plantains. Oh, bueno. This bueno, gives bueno. me religion. Yeah? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's the soul. Yeah. It's the soul. It makes me want to dance. And you're, and you're <laughs> my people know how to cook. <laughs> yes! Yes, Lord. yes. Woo! -hoo. Yeah. Having a good time. Man. Huh? I am a f I love to eat. It takes you home? Takes my you. Ha yeah, it takes me home. It's my hobby, and it's delicious. It's so good. That's the plantain, and it's sliced the long way, and they make a cup out of it, 
and put this wonderful chopped beef in it. So, so tell me a little bit in Puerto Rico, Christmas. Is it, oh. is it, is it a six day? Roast, like in Italy we do. Roast don't... pig. And it is a six day thing. And uh, when we were doing that kind of Christmas in New York City in our little ghetto apartment, you had to measure the oven because it was small. And you have, when you went to the butcher, the, the Hispanic butcher, you had to be sure that, that it was really a little suckling pig. That would fit. Because it wouldn't fit. Mm. Or if, if uh, that was not possible, then you would divide the creature so that uh, you could put it together on the, at the dinner table. But um, that's what you did. Here's to my new friend. For Rita, I adapted her traditional Christmas roast pig and came up with delicious braised pork shanks with fennel. And you're short of having your lechon, your suckling pig, <laughs> we have some, some uh, pork uh, uh, shanks here. Oh, All right? Bravo! Oh, beautiful? Bravo. Okay. Bravo. We'll, we'll oh, play this. Okay. Now, Carlo, in Italy, we talked about holidays and Christmas. But we have on the 6th of January, we have La Befana. La Befana, which, oh. is, which is my brother's birthday, by the way. Oh, is it? That's right. And, and uh, how did you celebrate the traditional way? Yeah, there was one big staple of the holiday food, which is panettone. Panettone. Yes. Panettone, which is an Italian yeah. sweet bread. Uh-huh. Oh, with, I love with, panettone. With candied, uh, with, with candied fruits, with, uh, with raisins, which is extremely fattening, <laughs> but very good. Carlo says his mother, Sofia Loren, was a fabulous cook. So when Carlo arrived in New York, we decided to make pasta together in honor of his mother. My mother is a wonderful cook, as you know. She, yes, she published yes. several cookbooks. Yes. But uh, in her family, her mother, Romilda, was a fantastic cook, and her sister, Maria, is a fantastic cook. So, so, the, so there's a lineage of, of great cooks from her mother's uh, side. Spaghetti con le vongole is my mother's favorite dish. There's many foods that were a staple of my youth. Most of all was homemade pasta. It's kind of like an ingrained thing, like music. If you grew up with a musician, automatically maybe you might not choose it to, to make it your profession, but you know about music. It's been around you all your life. And it's the same thing with Italians, with cooking. You've seen, I've seen my mother cook, I've seen her sister cook. So, so, so cooking was always very much intertwined with the daily activities. So one of the best things about this uh, pasta with clams is uh, is really simple dish. You need uh, just few ingredients. We need some clams, and of course in Italy, if you were in Italy, we use uh, vongole verace. Here we have uh, some manila clams. They look like vongole verace, and then uh, we have some of uh, um, local uh, clams, little necks for flavor. They're a little sharper on the flavor. Garlic, uh, peperoncino, parsley, olive oil. Nothing else. Totally. Uh, the other things we do is we, we finish to cook the pasta in, uh, in, in here, so they absorb a little bit the, the juice of the, of the clams. So let's get it out now and we cook it here. Pasta raw, almost. So we could start to cook now the pasta a little bit here on, uh, on this juice. Exactly. So here yeah. we start to put now um, some of our condiments, we put all the, the little parsley. Si fanno addirittura con le... Si, si, si mette poi la pasta e si cucina tutto insieme. Si, 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 si,
from a long line of Buddhist priests and Shinto priests, um, they didn't celebrate Christmas. So when my mother immigrated to this country, she was trying very hard in her effort to become an American to cook an American Christmas meal. And invariably, that would be some sort of undercooked turkey that was just <laughs> awful. And, 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 you know, the mashed potatoes weren't just quite right. And my mother grew up, you know, in a house that basically had a thatched roof and an open fire pit. I mean, she yeah. didn't have an oven. She didn't know how to cook in an oven with an oven. So, I mean, so she just had no idea. Mm -hmm. Marcus, what signifies mm. Christmas for you? Uh, first, I think about actually seafood. There was five types of herrings on a smorgasbord. There was smoked salmon and there was gravlax and there was a lot of different cheeses. And then always, always meatballs. You know, because every family couldn't actually have ham, so but meatballs every family had. Harlem, New York is home to Marcus Samuelson, a very successful chef and restaurateur. When I knew Marcus would be joining us for Christmas dinner, I wanted to spend time with him in his community. Now, how, how long are you here now? Almost five years. Five so. years. We met up at his restaurant, Red Rooster. All our family is like sort of a band of misfits in a good way. Our, my auntie was Jewish, my other cousins are Koreans, my other cousins were French Canadians. So it's like when we got together, it was this big world of the Samuelsons. We look different. You ready? I'm ready. This is Swedish here. meatball. This is not IKEA style, OK? Uh, this is real. So I just put a little bit of water, uh -huh. and then just grab them like this. We use a little bit of ice here, uh -huh. just to keep it chill. chill. Meatballs for me was always a dish that I loved making with my grandmother, because as a child, you can roll them. You can, you know, you can really participate a lot. Uh, and there's something that, you know, very enjoyable when you've been part of making the food that completely changed the flavor of the food. Now, what, what do you have in there? In so this, this is mainly pork, right? A little bit of veal and beef. So there's three, it could be pork, lamb, and beef, but most of the, 50% is pork. Uh -huh. Onions, bread crumbs, a little bit of uh, honey. Ah an egg to tie it all together, uh -huh. and a little bit of cream. No bread? A little bit of breadcrumbs, oh, yes, okay. yes, yes, okay. yes. You're talking to an Italian here. Yes, 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 yes. I, I grew up with this stuff. And then we add, like, pickling solution. We pickle everything, right? And put a little bit of that pickling solution in the gravy, and it's super delicious. We saute them in sort of medium heat, not super hot. OK. But okay. when you think about meatballs, you think about also the accompaniment, right? Oh. We have mashed potato and a little bit of cabbage. You would end up with tomato sauce and sometimes pasta, right? But, let, me uh, taste, let me taste a little bit of the cabbage. Yeah. And we had, for yeah. us at home, it was maybe carrots. It could have been cabbage. It's whatever sort of you had. When I thought about meat, it was always minced meat. It was minced meat big. because it's all the tough parts yeah. of the meat, you know. Filet. Who ate filet? Yeah. That was non-existent. <laughs> So the mussels, the only yeah. leftover pieces, mm. you ground them into a meatball. And uh, uh, you, you, you have them for the holidays especially? I can't think about having, celebrating the holidays without not having meatballs. Okay. And it might not have to be the main course, but it's there on the table. Uh -huh. You know, we don't eat one dish, we eat many dishes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you go and pick like a smorgasbord. Board. Board. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what you're known for. So dive in first. <laughs> you ready to eat? I certainly am. All right. Wow. There you go. Okay. Let's go and eat. Let's go. Food is a common denominator. Food breaks all the barriers and is a communicator. A table is a very special place. Oh, you're going to serve me? Great. Yes. Serve me the way it is. A lot of time, families have difficulties. Oh, I can't communicate. Yeah. Get some good food on the table. <laughs> Get the kids and the parents and the grandparents, right. everybody at the table. Right. You'll see. Okay. My house, it was the place where we found out, like, if my sister had a boyfriend, if school was doing good, yeah, you know, we were yeah, doing yeah, yeah. All good the in school. Good and the bad came out. All the, all, all the other stuff. But you stuff. know, us Italians at the table, we, we sing, argue, uh, love, everything. The table is just, everything comes out. And if you didn't have, you know, that dinner conversation, that stop in the day, 
You didn't know what was going on. It, it was like a... It didn't connect. No, it, it's no connectivity. You it just went on school or work, but it was no connectivity. So food that. can really communicate many sentiments. It's a, definitely a memory and transport. And also, I think in this day and age, when we live so fast, food is the one last thing that you can tell cross generations. I mean, think about even your family, right? When you want to describe for the grandkids where you came from, what would do it better than the food, right? Mm. It really gives them a sense of what? This is like north to south of the soul, given every region. Because Italy has much The table is such a special place to be. When you're at the table, when you're breaking bread with somebody, I think food unites you, makes well, you one. Well, is universal, you're, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think also, like, it's not, a, it's not an accident that most of the rituals and holidays and celebrations are done over food. Every major emotional um, milestone in our lives as a culture, whether it's you know Eastern European culture or Swedish culture, Indian culture, Italian culture, it's all done over food. You know, it's woven into the very fabric of our lives. There's only two things you need to survive. Two things, food for your body and love for your heart. That's why the two are often intertwined. Knowing how important food is to Padma and her culture, we took time during our visit to India to really experience the flavors. We met up with Padma's aunt and sampled some of their favorite family recipes. Thank you for having me here. This is beautiful in your home. It's gone. Okay. So I'm gonna show you how to make that simple curry. And uh, you could use any two vegetables. Your choice is now you have sweet potatoes here and... And peas today. Yes. And peas and lots of spices. And lots of spices. <laughs> Dried red chilies. Red chilies and... Black mustard seeds or brown mustard seeds. Okay. And you leave them like this whole? You don't crush them? Just, no, no, no. Just leave them like... And here you have... Cumin. Cumin. Cumin ah, seeds. Seeds. Oh, very nice. This is some coriander, fresh uh -huh. cilantro for later. Uh -huh. This is garlic. But we chop uh, that up. Yeah. We chop a little garlic up, yes. yeah. And the ginger. And ginger. And ginger. Because I've mostly grown up in the States, I, I love all the things that most people love, you know, whether it's mac and cheese or, you know, a salad or whatever, the most simple things. But instead of a regular mac and cheese, maybe I'll add ras al hanout from Morocco to the mac and cheese. You know, if I'm making a roast chicken, maybe I'll add Moroccan preserved lemons to that roast chicken. Or, you know, if I'm making banana bread, maybe I'll add a pinch of clove powder. Yeah, typically, a, a regular South Indian meal is always rice, plain rice, uh -huh. with some kind of soupy lentil, like sambar or rasam, which usually, you know, has different kinds of lentils, but is a watery, very uh, stewy or clear broth to it. Uh -huh. And then there's always a dry curry, a sauteed dried vegetable Veg curry. And this is it? Yeah, today okay. this is it. Nobody really taught anybody how to cook. You would get corrected very sternly if you didn't do things right, because by the time you were allowed to do anything, you would have watched it being done a hundred times. No. In my grandmother's kitchen, there was always something happening. Either a meal was winding down or a meal was gearing up. Often those two things happened at the same time. When my grandfather was alive, he wouldn't allow us to use garlic in our food because it was very impure, he thought. <laughs> Even the onion we had to be very sparing with, only if somebody was really sick. My grandmother would smash a little bit of garlic and add it to whatever dish because she liked the taste of it. But uh, we had come from a Brahmin so, family. So, so you can see who the boss was? All the, oh yeah, my, <laughs> my grandmother is always the boss. Yeah, yeah. The, the women. Is it yeah. like in the Italian family? Pretty the, much. The men <laughs> think they're the boss. But the women. Yeah, you let them think that. I love that. I'm putting cumin, cumin uh, seeds. Uh-huh. And we're going to add the onion as well. Okay. And also the garlic and ginger. Not the coriander, because anything that's a tender herb, yeah. you're gonna add at the end so that the end. chlorophyll doesn't cook out. And you can see, it just has to get some color. Yeah. So now we're adding the potatoes. Uh-huh. Oh. Uh -huh.
This is called an irigi. No self-respecting housewife is without this. Okay. It's to hold the pot still. Ah. And when you get married, you either you get your mother's or you get your own, but it's always engraved. Is it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing how cultures, you know, around the world are so different. And yet, yet they're, they're similar. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the Italian culture is very close to Indian culture. The attitudes about foods and family the, and, you the, know. The philosophy of the all sitting at the table. Okay, we are ready. Oh, this you. vegetable is also my favorite. Ah, it's okay. called Moringa. After learning some of the nuances of Indian cooking, yeah. We sat down and ate a traditional meal together. So we gave you very little. Please feel free to have a lot more. But okay. it is a powerful thing. So then you don't use all the fingers. Yeah. You use three like this. Yeah. Three. And then you just mix it. Oh, okay. And then you push it in with your thumb. That's a trick. For Padma, inspired by her roots in India, I made sweet potatoes with cannellini beans. Padma, mm. this is in your honor. Oh, thank your, you. your, your, your aunt showed us something similar. It's, it's, uh, what is this called? I try to get close to it. It's sweet potatoes. It's sweet potato and lima bean yes. curry. And there's another bean in India that's close to it. But you can make it with white beans. You can make it with any bean. All right, so you'll tell me how, how, how we interpret it. Your, your aunt's recipe. Uh. As the evening progresses, we reflect and give thanks for the food and opportunities we found here in America. I always feel coming to America was like I had to, right? You know, being born in one place, being adopted, being born in Africa, but then being raised in Sweden. Even if you, I didn't know my African background until I was adult, really, truly, culturally, I didn't know it. But I always thought about sort of, you have to go to America. I came uh, as a teenager, and right away, I fell in love with New York City, you know? How could you not? And I came to Times Square, I think we got robbed, and I fell in love in the same minute. <laughs> but I still love it. It's yeah, like, it spoke to me, it's like, this is amazing, you know? For Padma, leaving India meant moving to a place that was more accepting. ...of what you can and can't do aren't as rigid in this culture than they may have been or are in, in you know, our native or mother cultures. And I think that's important too. You know, you, you have much more opportunity to explore something that's, that's not so conventional or predictable or obvious. You know, you have a chance to try it. You know, where I don't think in other cultures it's as open. This is yeah. diverse. Carlo credits much of his success to the generosity offered to him in America. You know, now that we're on the subject of America, of, of the land of opportunity, I mean, I, I could not, you know, have started uh, my orchestra, which I started a, a few years ago, were it not if I, if I lived in America, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, you have so much philanthropy here, people give you the chance to, to do things that, that you cannot find uh, in other countries, especially That's in Europe. That's a great thing to bring up, thank you. As dinner winds down, it becomes clear that we are building every day on the lives we have here. Yes, it's delicious. Oh, I love wow. Can you propose yeah. a toast to Lydia and say thank you so much oh, yeah. for oh, having delicious. you right. introducing us to our... Thank you. Um, thank you so much. You know, there's nothing better than being at the table with friends and family. It just doesn't get any better. The holidays are a very special time of the year. It's a time that the family gathers together. And no matter what you believe in, let's really assess the values in life. Let's uh, think about, you know, our own nourishment, our own pleasure. And let's think and talk about who we really are and where we come from, our roots, our culture. It's a time to relax, to reflect, to enjoy each other, to replenish our souls and our senses and then be ready to move on in life until another year. Merry Christmas. Oh, pleasure. Happy New Year. It was a once-in-a-lifetime meal shared with family and friends. We wish you a merry
Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Lydia Celebrates America, Home for the Holidays, is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Thank you.